My name is Dan Madigan. I'm a, a Jesuit. Uh, I teach in the theology department uh, here at Georgetown University. Um, and I've, been, I've had the privilege and the great pleasure to be involved uh, with the Building Bridges seminars since uh, 2003. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful to everyone who has been who's made this possible over the years because uh, I've made some wonderful friends and uh, learned a great deal. Here we are, our, our next speaker. Our topic for this afternoon is religion, modernity, and freedom. And uh, our first speaker is Professor Abdullahi Ahmed Naim. Uh, Professor Naim is the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Law at Emory University, where he's been teaching since 1995. Before, prior to that, he was the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch for Africa, uh, and he has been a scholar in residence and a teacher in many other places. Uh, his PhD in law is from the University of Edinburgh, and prior to that, his legal training was uh, at the University of Cambridge and the University of Khartoum. His most recent work uh, uh, is Islam and the Secular State, Negotiating the Future of Sharia, which was published by Cambridge University Press. We had the privilege of having uh, Professor Anaim as a visiting scholar at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Um, I think spring of last year, was it, Abdul? Uh, so without further ado, uh, then I shall in introduce our second speaker just before he speaks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, and good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm truly grateful for the privilege of being part of this seminar for the first time. I've already learned a lot and expect to learn more and when I, when I take these occasions, uh, the, the privilege of, of, of addressing um, such an audience, of course, in addition to the challenge of the after lunch uh, presentation, <laughs> but the privilege is to try to be as provocative and as challenging as I can. And I hope everybody will find something that is <laughs> not offensive, but at least uh, thought provoking in what I'm going to say. Uh, and I also appreciate David's wisdom in having the series of lectures today from the broader general to the transition, the more recent to the more specific uh, issue focused uh, set of, of presentations now. So my, my topic, uh, and there is a full text of the paper, which I think I assume will be on the website uh, available for download. Uh, it's rather a long paper, but uh, at least I do not hope to read or to present it in full here. I will try to highlight some aspects of it. The, my title is Islam, Modernity, and Freedom, Mediating Competing Claims of Freedom of Speech and Religion. And I start the paper with a, a few premise remarks about ends and means uh, that I think it is helpful to think in terms of what do we mean and why do we need to have certain freedoms, uh, because that might help us understand the scope of the rights and the claims and the condition and context in which those rights are exercised. And I will touch at the end on, on the question of the formation of religion uh, as an example of how this notion of competing claims uh, can and should be mediated. Um, another premise I, I make is that freedom of religion and speech, but I think prim primarily freedom of religion, the concept itself requires freedom of religion to be free and voluntary. That is, there is no sense whatsoever of speaking of religion that is not freely adopted and freely retained. And you'll see, because I'm referencing the notion of apostasy and heresy, in my remarks later on, why I emphasize from the very start that the very idea of religion, at least for Islam, for myself, is that it has to be a voluntary choice. There is no possibility of belief without the possibility of disbelief. That logically, I cannot believe unless it is equally possible for me not to believe. And there is no value in belief that is not voluntary. Um, and that is how I approach the subject, I think. The notion of competing claims uh, is, I think, a helpful way of trying to understand that 
since we don't have ways of adjudicating truth, we don't have way of adjudicating even what is good social policy, uh, it has to be a process of mediation. It has to be a process of negotiation, consensus building uh, at all levels and so on. And for that, I focus more on the context or rather the framework and the process of mediation. So assuming that we cannot really get to understand what freedom of religion can mean or freedom of speech means, except through mediation, then we have to understand where can we do this mediation most uh, effectively, uh, most inclusively, most fairly, and what, what sort of uh, factors and, and conditions are necessary for that process. And for that, I think, as, as Dan has already mentioned, I, I if, uh, sort of bring in my notion of the secular state as a necessary framework for the mediation of rights and freedoms. And I will explain what I mean by that, but I think uh, primarily it's a notion of a state that is neutral regarding religious doctrine. It does not take a position on religion, neither for nor against. As the, uh, the Archbishop Williams have said last night in a conversation, I'm already stealing the idea, it's a procedural uh, sort of notion of, of, of secularism. It's not secularism as a life philosophy. It is not secularization of society. It is secularity of the state, you might say. And, and for that, I, I bring in notions of civic reason as the process by which mediation can happen, by, by which state policy can be uh, adopted and framed. I bring in notions of constitutionalism, human rights, and citizenship as a general framework for the mediation of rights. I argue for uh, several propositions, so I thought, given the time constraint, I might try to list the propositions I'm arguing for. One is that there is a necessary unavoidable tension and conflict within rights and among rights. That the, all rights, whether it's freedom of religion, freedom of speech, none of them is absolute, none of them is, is, is a given, and it is very much a process of trying to understand uh, the tensions within the right itself, uh, as in freedom of religion or freedom of speech, and also among rights, those rights and other rights too. That second, I, I do believe that there are legitimate limitations on rights, that it is not a question of, of rights as, as absolutes, the question is not whether or not we should have limitations. The question is, what are the limitations? Where should the lines be drawn? By whom? For what purposes? And so on. So that is, again, part of the mediation I will be speaking of. And another a third proposition is that there should not be any religiously mandated legal consequence. Uh, to uh, violation of uh, sort of notions of religious authenticity or uh, integrity and so on. So that if there are consequences to follow from heresy, for example, or apostasy or uh, harsh or even um, um, uh, problematic speech, uh, those consequences should not be legal, but should, uh, although they are necessary, I think, and unavoidable social and psychological consequences. That is, we should not expect, I think, our exercise of freedom of religion or freedom of speech to be risk-free or to be uh, non-problematic for the speaker or for society at large. So the challenge is to both sides to understand that when I speak, when I exercise a right or a freedom, I am assuming responsibility and I am accountable for what I do at some level. The question is how to make that accountability conducive to enhancing the freedom in question rather than undermining it. Uh, it is very general, but I hope that uh, some of the remarks to follow might, might help explain. And, and finally, I, I argue for an internal transformation of Muslim attitudes, in, the case of, in my case, of Muslims, uh, about issues of freedom of religion and speech. That is, that the, the best strategy is the one of internal transformation. We need legal safeguards. We need, we need international cooperation and supervision and, and monitoring and so on. But ultimately, the most sustainable way of promoting the values of freedom of religion and freedom of speech is an internal transformation in the attitude of Muslims uh, or Christians and so on about particular values and issues. Talking about Muslims, therefore, I, I move on in the paper to try to explain what I mean, what I understand by Islam or what is Islamic in the discourse. And I think, of course, obviously, the Quran and Sunnah 
uh, are the primary uh, marker of what is Islamic. So uh, if a discourse is Islamic, it has to reference the Quran and Sunnah. But the point here is that there has always been, so there is a permanent and extreme diversity of interpretations. Not only that, but that interpretation is unavoidable, that it is inherent to the nature of, and I think we have heard about this this morning already, so I don't need to belabor the point, but this notion of extreme diversity, which emphasizes the issues and the importance of freedom of religion and speech, that there is no sort of uh, self-evident uh, permanent religious truth that we can all acknowledge and accept. I think we are always going to contest and dispute what that religion, religious freedom uh, knowledge or truth is and so on. The notion of Sharia uh, also is, is critical to our understanding of, of the issues here. And by that I mean, uh, of course, Sharia is often is associated with Islam so much as if people tend to think of uh, as if Sharia is synonymous with Islam. And of course it's not. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is an aspect of Islam, it's an entry point, it's a way of, of coming into the experience of being a Muslim, but by no means exhaust the possibilities of experiencing Islam religiously. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to try to deconstruct the notion of Sharia slightly, I speak of Sharia as a concept, and as a content, and as a context, or in relation to context. Meaning that the idea of Sharia is actually what most people most of the time mean when they say Sharia. And Muslims are in, in, in love with the idea of Sharia more than the actual content of what Sharia is. And I think I, I often find that when people come to face exactly what it means in terms of its substantive uh, content, most people get some, some second source. But of course, having first committed to Sharia being divine, they can't take back that commitment and say, no, well, I would like to reconsider. Uh, and one, one point I'm making here is that Sharia is not divine. Sharia is a human understanding of the divine. The Quran is divine. The Hadith of the Prophet is divine to be as a Muslim. But Sharia is not. Sharia is a human understanding. And there is no way of accessing Sharia as a concept except through human understanding and experience. Uh, and when it comes to the content, the context is historical contingent. So what Sharia as an idea means when it comes to what it means in terms of its actual principles and norms, that is a contextual historically conditioned understanding. And as such, it cannot be permanent, it is not immutable, and it is not divine by any means. And the context is understanding, uh, as, as we have seen this morning already, in the transition and transformation of Muslim societies in the modern context, and how that is the context in which now we have to relate to Sharia. One element about Islam also is to emphasize personal responsibility. Being a Muslim is being unable to abdicate responsibility. A Muslim is responsible no, and can never abdicate that responsibility whether we are aware of it or not, whether we are uh, taking, uh, acknowledging it consciously or not. And the centrality of human agency, and I think also the, this morning we have seen that factor. Just referencing, by the way, this discussion to, uh, this morning about uh, religious authority, to me religious authority is always personal to the believer. Religious authority is in the eyes of the beholder. It is not anywhere else. It is only when the believer concedes religious authority to anybody else that person becomes authoritative or that institution becomes authoritative to the believer. But the point about an inability to abdicate responsibility is to say that, that we are responsible even for our concession of religious authority. That I do not cease to be responsible by conceding religious authority to some institution or group. And I will be responsible for whatever I do or fail to do, whatever I say or fail to say. The nature of Sharia also is that it is intergenerational consensus based, meaning that there is no enacting authority. There has never been. There is no enacting moment of any principle of Sharia. You cannot trace what Muslims now accept as Sharia to a particular moment in time, and you say, this is when it started. So it is a very 
mysterious, you might say, process of intergenerational consensus. And the reason I emphasize this is that the possibilities of creating new initiatives for intergenerational consensus. But also that, also the, the flip side of that, it means that we cannot have instant formation of Sharia. That we have to invest in the struggle for transforming our understanding of it, and for that reason we need freedom of religion and freedom of speech. But the nature of the process is spontaneous, inter, intergenerational. And also similarly, the notions of ittihad, the notions of consensus, uh, are also very promising possibilities of transformation. What I find problematic, and I touch on that in the paper, is that many of us call for ittihad, very few of us exercise ittihad. I mean, even some of the texts that we will be de uh, deliberating in this uh, seminar, people calling for ittihad from Muhammad Abdu to, to, to Tariq Ramadan. But very few actually exercise ittihad and give us an outcome to judge what does it mean and what, what value does it have. So I, I'm calling for a more systematic and a more principled exercise of ittihad. About modernity, and time is short, is uh, I'm not going into the, uh, the whole struggle about the debates about modernity and moder modernism and whether we have it, who has it, who, who authored it, and all of that. My, to, to quote uh, a line from American modernity, the bottom line is, for me, I have, I have no use for a modernity in which I have no place. That is, if my own agency, my own self-determination is not reflected and experienced in the whatever sense of modernity we're speaking of, it's irrelevant to me. So I don't care to claim modernity. But if there is such a thing and I have a stake in it, I have a say in what it means to me and to my experience and to my community, then I, don't, I, I, would, I would welcome uh, the idea and work with it and so on. So it is, it is that sense of, um, uh, the, one, the sense I take of modernity is this notion of contingency, ambiguity, ambivalence, this sort of hesitancy, lack of certainty and certitude. And that I find to be deeply Islamic in, in, in intellectual history of Muslims and Islam. In fact, the whole notion of Sharia in Muslim discourse is described as zanni meaning propositional or suppositional. That Muslim scholars have always acknowledged that nobody can ever know exactly and truly and definitively what Sharia is. Everybody is guessing. So that, that is the notion of zanni. And to me, that's a deeply modern notion. And I, we have heard from uh, Vincent this morning about how also notions of, of, of modernity that you can find deeply in the tradition. Now, moving on to freedom. To me, freedom is liberation from fear. Uh, and it is about uh, an inner state of peace. That is what freedom is. We may need uh, sort of uh, procedurally and instrumentally institutional and normative uh, conditions for ex maximizing our freedom or experiencing our freedom, but it is always an inner state of being. And for that, I mean, human rights are necessary but insufficient. And so are many of our institutions and our, our systems and so on. Recalling very much the notion of ends and means that has started with, to me, uh, human rights, um, protection of freedom of religion, freedom of speech, are means to the end of inner freedom. And that is the reason why religion is fundamental to my understanding of freedom because it is the ultimate and the most effective means of achieving that inner peace and state of being, state of being at peace with oneself. And, and for that reason, I think it, it is to, to engage religion is, is really critical in my experience, but everything else uh, is a means to that end, and that end itself of the religion, religion as an end is also a means to my inner freedom. Uh, Another aspect of my understanding of freedom is that it has to be shared for it to be meaningful. That is, my freedom of religion is coherent and useful to my ends of achieving inner peace and, and consistency with my own sense of being, only to the extent that others have the same freedom. 
freedom, my freedom of speech is meaningless without other people having a similar freedom of equal freedom of speech so that we can engage in discourse and so on. There is a lot to say, but I, I should move on uh, because of time constraints to touch on the question of apostasy and the notion of related notions like uh, blasphemy or, or um, Zandaka um, um, in, in the Islamic discourse or notions of, of uh, heresy. And here I think, of course, again in the paper you'll find that I challenge the very possibility of punishing apostasy at all as a crime. As I said earlier, I, I cannot preclude all sorts of social and psychological consequences to dissent. I mean, dissidents suffer for their dissent, but the question is to minimize that, the, the, that the suffering so that we can all ex experience the possibility of dissent. And I make a, a heretical proposition, which is to say that heresy is necessary for the possibility of being religious. It's again that side of the notion of uh, the possibility of belief uh, requires the possibility of disbelief. That every orthodoxy is started as a heresy. There is no orthodoxy today that was not a heresy one day. So we need heresy. We need heretics. And in fact, we should celebrate heretics and heresy. <laughs> because that is, that is what challenges our religions and keeps them honest, and keep them true to their values, and keep them true to their mission. And the hypocrisy, which is the, 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 the opposite of which is when you concede a point not out of conviction but out of fear of consequences, is the negation of, of the quality of being religious, the possibility and the willingness to take the risk of being a heretic is integral to the possibility of being religious, I believe. So in, in that sense, I think apostasy is, is untenable in, at every level. It does not have authority in the Quran whatsoever. In fact, the Quran in chapter 4, verse 137, uh, in fact, it speaks about those who believe and then disbelieve and then believe and then disbelieve again. They will be punished by God in the next life. So the fact that the Quran contemplates that someone who believes and then disbelieves remains alive and in the community, otherwise he or she couldn't exercise another uh, sort of uh, this, uh, experience of disbelief, so to me categorically precludes the possibility. But of course I'm not denying the reality that in the wide sort of consensus among Muslim scholars, uh, apostasy, a ridda, is punishable, a crime punishable by death, but I'm saying that this is something that we have to confront and challenge categorically as totally untenable morally, politically, legally, and in, in every other respect. And for that, I, I come to close, or c c uh, close to my conclusion to say that a secular state in the way that I described as one that is neutral regarding religious doctrine, that it does not take a position on my religiosity or lack of it. It is none of the business of the state. What the state is entitled to care for is my behavior in relation to other people. If I harm some other person, then that is subject. But the question is if, if what I hold in my own uh, conscience and belief is my own business and so on. So that, I think, is, is critical. So hopefully in, in the discussion, I will have a chance to elaborate. But to, to conclude on the question of the formation of religion, because I think it is a controversy that is recent and current, and, uh, and there are, of course, pros and cons. And you are aware, I'm sure, of the 1999 proposal by Pakistan and the International Islamic Conference to create an international standard uh, sort of declaration on the formation of religion. And of course, I mean, uh, let, let me be clear, I'm against that. I'm against that notion of the formation of religion. I'm opposed to the notion of, of religion being, being it possible for religion to be defamed. I don't accept that. I don't accept that any human being has the right or obligation to defend Islam. Uh, if Islam is a religion and a valid religion, it's more capable of defending itself than any human being can defend it. That's my own personal position. What I am arguing for in relation to the mediation notion is to say that we have to understand where the apprehensions and concerns are coming from and the motivations. Some are good and some are bad, some are mixed. So to, to engage, and in this regard, I think we should avoid assuming that some side of the issue or some people on one side of the issue 
have the truth, and the other side are hypocritical or, or manipulative, opportunistic, and so on. We should not attribute bad intentions to people. We should take their arguments at their face value. And to debate and question, I mean, what are the dangers and what are the risks, risks of the notion of defamation of religion, the difficulty of defining the notion, the risks of using the international sort of uh, standard, if it should come about, to persecute rather than to liberate, to intimidate, to intimidate and to suppress that, that, rather than to liberate. And in any case, whatever intentions and whatever motivations are behind the the call for the formation of religion standard, they are not going to be served legitimately by that notion. So, but the point I'm concluding with is to say that that's a very clear example of a current debate in which working with the notion of mediation of competing claims is a, a good way of trying to come to an understanding of where to draw the line in terms of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and so on and so forth. I wait for your discussion and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Abdu. Our second speaker is Dr. David Bentley Hart. Uh, Dr. Hart is an orthodox theologian, a philosopher and writer. Uh, I believe now you're uh, working for First Things, correct? Mm. Or not. <laughs> He's taught at the University of Virginia, the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, uh, the Duke Divinity School, Loyola, as it then was, College in Maryland, as it now is Loyola University in Maryland, uh, and also as, at Providence College. Uh, his most recent book uh, is an engagement with uh, the new atheists uh, called Atheist Delusions, uh, Christian Revolution <coughs> and its, The Christian Revolution and Its Fashionable Enemies, uh, from Yale University Press last year. David Bentley Hart. Uh, I'll try to be audible. Uh, hay fever is playing havoc with my vocal cords. So. My thanks to the Archbishop of Canterbury and everyone else responsible for, for inviting me here and to Georgetown University and to Meg McWhorter for giving me uh, her magnetic strip for my name card when I lost mine <clears throat> this morning. Sharpness of intellect for which I'm renowned. Uh, it's very gallant of her, really. She just whipped her own off, gave it to me. Brother once offered me his kidney when I had an infection. Uh, but other than that, I've never had an experience that it was so breathtaking. I, I didn't need the kidney as it happened, anyway. So, so. Don't like half-hearted gestures, anyway. I said, give them both to me or I'm not taking any. Um, so um, the... the, the um, Topic of religion, modernity, and freedom in, addressed in 30 minutes, of course, means that I, since it can't be addressed in 30 minutes, means I have license to make as many uh, bold generalizations as I can possibly fit into that, that time frame, so forgive me. If uh, this gets a bit uh, uh, synoptic, and I say many things that I don't defend, but modernity, to the degree that it uh, was or is a kind of cultural project or epochal ideology, understands itself as a history of freedom. Or rather, I, I would say, the one grand cultural and historical narrative that we modern persons tend to share, and that most sharply distinguishes a modern from a pre-modern sensibility in many ways, uh, is the story of liberation, the story of the ascent of the individual out of the shadows uh, of um, hierarchy and subsidiary identity into the light of full recognition, dignity, and autonomy. And it's a very powerful narrative. Uh, whether we prefer it in the simple form of the philosophes, uh, freedom from the constraints of tradition, the discovery of an ethos uh, obedient to universal reason, a more rigorous Kantian form, the discovery that this uh, ethos is founded ultimately upon the individual's rational autonomy, uh, a more speculative Hegelian form that, that uh, sees freedom as a positive achievement of the rational civil state, uh, 
uh, or romanticism, a return to innocent spontaneity, uncorrupted by culture, the sort of libertarian form of the great Gnostic adventure called America, uh, thanks, I don't need your help, uh, or some eclectic mixture of all. And it does not amount to a single ideological program, but it does give rise to a bewildering variety of analogous and often incompatible ideologies that, in a sense, show us what our highest cultural value is, to which all other values are, in some sense, subordinate. Now, it's become something of a commonplace in recent years to observe that the modern understanding of freedom differs qualitatively uh, and rather radically from most classical or medieval conceptions of freedom. So this is one, one story. Um, according to these latter, so the story goes, true freedom is the realization of a complex nature in its proper ends, both natural and supernatural, the power of a thing to flourish, to become ever more fully what it is. Uh, but to think of freedom this way, one has to believe, of course, that we possess an actual nature and also that there is a transcendent good towards which that nature can be oriented. To be fully free, then, is to be joined to the end for which our natures were originally framed. And whatever separates us from that end, even if it's our own personal choices, can be a form of bondage, uh, or, or can only be a form of bondage. We're free, that is to say, within this way of thinking, not because we can choose, but only if we have chosen well. And ultimate liberation requires us to look to, well, they use the, the Platonic image, the sun of the good, these lights are brighter than the sun, incidentally, so uh, in order to learn how to choose. And the more we emerge from illusion, the more perfect our vision becomes, and in a sense, the less there is to choose. Because the will becomes increasingly inalienable from its natural object. Now, the power of choice, however dispensable it may be, indispensable it may be to this pilgrimage towards the good, is a minimal condition for a freedom that can be achieved only when that power has been taken up into a higher power, the power of one who is naturally unable to sin, as St. Augustine would say. Um, it's a state in which the consonance between desire and its proper object is so perfect that goodness is hardly even an ethical category any longer. Now, within these terms, it once made perfect sense to say that God is infinitely free because in his infinite actuality and simplicity, he can't be alienated from his own nature, which is the good itself, and he's incapable of evil. Uh, today, I think, um, when we're thinking in our most habitual and unreflective way, that sort of language sounds a bit bizarre. Uh, we tend to think of freedom quite often uh, as I say again, habitually, as a sort of libertarian autonomy, a sort of spontaneous volition, which is the negative freedom of the unrestrained or minimally restrained individual will. If we conceive of it at all as the realization of our nature, it's only because we've come to think of that sort of free spontaneity as what human nature most essentially is. And so many, uh, even though many of the seminal modern narratives of liberation, the enlightenment and romantic narratives alike, often understood freedom as the release of an aboriginal human nature from traditions that uh, corrupted it, the modern conception of freedom achieves its most logically consistent form, at least you know, in this limited sense I'm talking about, only when practically all constraints have come to be seen as arbitrary and extrinsic. And when the very idea of a natural or intrinsic constraint just comes to be seen as a, as a sort of alien imposition on the sovereignty of the will. In this sense, the modern notion of freedom is, and I have to use this word carefully because it sounds polemical, it is, but I'm going to pretend it's not, uh, nihilistic, uh, using it in the technical sense that, that, it's, that, that it's a liberty that claims that its intentional horizon is not populated from the beginning with prior identifiable goods, and that rather the will is genuinely open to the indeterminate, that it, it, it doesn't, it's not determined by ends that are there before it begins willing. Uh, for us to be as free as we possibly can be, there must be nothing transcendent of the will that might command it towards ends it does not choose for itself, no value higher than what the will imposes upon its world. And so we can't, if, if we want to talk, as we often 
think we want to do about a society ordered towards transcendental goods, towards truth and goodness and beauty, it's very hard to say how it is that we, we also are talking about freedom, at least in modern terms. If true liberty is by definition a prior or two or utterly beyond our nature, there can be no coherent understanding of the law as a shared mediation between individual and common good, or between a community of free souls and the good as such. Law can be only constraint or permission, a determination of the relative preponderance of the power of the state or the license of the self, a greater or lesser aid to the realization of private ends or the suppression of conflicting desires. Thus, everything in the interval between state and self, community, natural association, all of culture, becomes a sort of lawless realm, a sort of shared privacy or elective localism, subject to the law's powers of restraint, but otherwise irrelevant to the law's primary function, which is to fortify the state and regulate the individual, securing both against claims that come from outside their relationship. Well, that was a lot to say. <laughs> Now, needless to say, such a concept of freedom is at some level irreducibly mythical. Desire is never purely indeterminate. It's always directed towards an end that is desired before it can be willed. The very first movement of the will, and I think any honest phenomenology of the very act of willing reveals this to us, um, is always towards some object of intention. And any distinct and finite object appears to the intellect as desirable because the will has already been wakened and desire evoked by a transcendental object, if you will, by the good as such. There's already a desire for that which is good, and everything else appears desirable to the degree to which we see it as fitting within that original orientation. So an absolutely negative liberty uh, even assuming such a thing could be created in the realm of law, still cannot make anyone free in this modern, pure sense. Such freedom doesn't exist in the abstract, the way we, we tend to formulate it. We cannot choose what to desire in a simple sense, uh, or choose either to desire or not to desire. And the fiction that we can, uh, if seriously believe may very well leave us dangerously susceptible to any number of external manipulations or accidental traumas of the will. Um, again, within stepping back into what we tend to think of as a more classical view of, of, of freedom, only a wisdom that allows one to distinguish worthy ends from worthless or to recognize the relative value of diverse desires can actually make one, in a meaningful sense, free. Only the acquisition of useful constraints and powers upon which one then can then reflect in relation to the good that one desires allows one to act consciously towards a meaningful end. And that seems to suggest, it would seem to suggest, that one uh, that, 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 that such a cultivation of desire must be as much a social as a personal project. And that should give shape to positive law, at least you know, within the Aristotelian tradition, for instance, this is clearly the case. Um, but the modern, purely libertarian concept, and, and especially in the states, I mean, this is, this is how we think. <laughs> um, makes it difficult even to imagine at times what a community of lawful freedom might really look like, and makes it even more difficult to notice how veiled behind the language of mere negative liberty, certain powers and enfranchised interests, the state, capital, ideology, have often supplanted the mediating realities of community and culture and faith in which positive law should be situated, and have gone about shaping our desires for us uh, now, it's also, following this, this story further, something of a commonplace uh, to assert that this modern understanding of what it means to be free is, to a certain extent, a late product or fortuitous metamorphosis of late scholastic voluntarism. Uh, that is, a great deal of late medieval and early modern Christian thought in its anxiety to protect, protect divine action against any imputation of necessity or compulsion either external or even internal to the divine will. The, the English are chiefly responsible for this, by the way. Thomas Bradwardine, I think. 
um, progressively altered the very concept of divine freedom. Divine sovereignty came to be imagined, and, and, and I'm not really exaggerating here, I've been through many of these texts lately, as such an abyss of pure power that God could even act in a way unrelated to his own essence. And this mysterious, pure power in which no creature can participate and over against which every movement of creaturely will is as nothing at all became in some sense the very definition of what it is for God to be God. Now there are very, I mean there are many, any number of reasons why this theology took shape. Um, and it, it, didn't, it didn't become the dominant theology of Western culture, but what did happen is that within a particular picture of God that was in a very particularly crucial period in Western his history, divine liberty was progressively equated with sheer spontaneity. Uh, and inevitably, that understanding of freedom migrated from theology into our picture of what it is to be human and began to shape moral, political, and social thought. And this can only lead in the direction, uh, ultimately, of, of atheism in a practical, if not a theoretical sense, uh, in the sense that if God's freedom is primarily this infinite power to elect what he will, and it's not even bound to the dictates of, of his own nature, uh, but in the most radical sense is his nature, and if human freedom is merely a finite instance of the same kind of liberty, then there's no ontological, there's no liaison between infinite and finite freedom. In the older model, there could not be a real, using that in a scholastic sense, there couldn't be a conflict between divine and human wills because the power of the human will was understood as a finite participation in the perfect and infinite power of God's freedom, his knowledge and love of his own goodness. Even sin was understood only as a, the misuse, the, the poorly aimed operation of this imparted movement of the will towards the good, a disordered love. In the newer model, however, the only relations between divine and human wills are either conflict or surrender, embraced within an irresoluble tension. Thus, all genuinely modern stories of liberation, presuming as they do some version of this model of freedom, perhaps must terminate in a final rebellion against God because he becomes the one intolerable rival who must be slain if humanity is ever to be free. And thus also much of the history of modern secularism, along with many of its humanist or collectivist or libertarian tales regarding the freedom of a humanity come of age, might very well be regarded from a Christian perspective as sort of doubly damnable. It's a rejection of God, but it's also the illegitimate offspring, offspring of a degenerate theology, an English theology. <laughs> now, you don't have to be what um, a Marxist would call an ideologist, you know, and believe that all, uh, all of modernity was born in the darkness of monastic cells. Uh, there are any number of material conditions that go uh, into the formation of, I mean, the, the rise of an enfranchised middle class, a new mer merchant class in the th at the beginning of modernity, for instance, a literate uh, bourgeois class, uh, and other things. But there is, I think, a great deal of truth in this story of the mutation of the concept of freedom from its more classical to its more modern form. But it's not the whole story. Christianity began not as an institution, not even as a creed, but as an event that had no proper precedent or any immediately conceivable sequel for, its, for the earliest believers. In its earliest dawn, the gospel arrived in history as a kind of convulsive disruption of history, a subversive rejection of a great many of the immemorial cultic, social, philosophical wisdoms of the ancient world. And the event that the gospel proclaimed, the event within the event, was the resurrection of Christ, which was not a religious event, not a natural event. It's not even a, an event within the history of religion, but it, it comes almost as a moment of pure interruption. According to Paul, it had effectively erased all the sacred, social, racial, and national boundaries gathered into itself all divine sovereignty over history. It subdued the spiritual agencies of the cosmos, the powers, the principalities, the God of this world. 
It was a complete liberation from the constraints of elemental existence, the stichia, but also the power of the law. For even the law of Moses, holy though it was, was still only delivered by an angel through a human mediator in order to operate as a kind of probationary disciplinarian, a pedagogos. It's often translated as tutor, but it really is more disciplinarian or governess or uh, something of that sort, and had now been replaced by this law of love. And so Christianity starts by entering human co consciousness not primarily as a new system of practices and observances, or as an alternative set of religious obligations, but first and foremost as apocalypse, the annunciation of the kingdom's sudden invasion of historical and natural time. Let me skip something here. In, the original form, in its original form, the gospel then was a pressing command to all persons to come forth out of the economies of society and cult into the immediacy of that event, for the days are short. And having thus been born in this expectation of time's imminent end, its first waking moment was utterly saturated by the knowledge that the end was near. I don't think the church was quite prepared at first, for some time, to exist, to inhabit time, except in a state of something like a sustained crisis. There's no obvious medium by which a people in some sense already living in history's aftermath in a state of constant urgency could enter history again as either an institution or a body of law or even a religion. It would take some time for it to be recuperated into something more stable and continuous, a kind of why tradition is so important perhaps for Christianity because it's the continuous fidelity to an interruption. From the beginning, consequently, there has been this paradoxical tension at the core of Christian belief. In religious terms, accommodation with and adaptation of cultic forms was possible, even though the church was a radically new kind of association in many ways. And that just happened as a kind of natural pseudomorphism. You know, it's, uh, that's a tired uh, metaphor, so I won't explain it. Um, it assumed many of the cultic and culturally intelligible configurations of its time, and this was inevitable and necessary because a perfectly apocalyptic consciousness, you know, subsisting purely in a moment of interruption simply can't be sustained beyond a certain brief period. It, it, certain exigencies demand that it become historical, become cultural, become cultic. And so there's a long history of both fidelity to this interruption and betrayal of it as is always the case with large institutions. And the alloy has never been entirely uh, stable. I think one of the reasons why Christianity is so fissile, all, all religions are, but Christianity has a special kind of desire to tear itself apart, it sometimes seems, uh, is this, the, the, this uh, reality that even in its most enduring and necessary historical forms, there is this, this desire not to crystallize, but to disperse into the future, to be more spirit than letter, more spirit than flesh. Now, why this is an elliptical way of getting back to the topic, but, but it seems to me that all of modernity's tales of liberation, if read in certain ways, in all their variety, are variations within or upon or in the shadow of this very particular history. It's, uh, it just seems to me that resistance to or flight from the authority of the law, conceived in a particular way, but even so, or sense of the law's ultimate nullity, lies at the heart of the gospel. In every modern demand for social and personal recognition as inherent rights, there is at least a distant echo of Paul's proclamation of the unanticipated free gift given in Christ. The peculiar restlessness, the ferment of modern Western history, great revolutions and local rebellions, a ceaseless generation of magnificent principles and insidious abstractions and so on and so on, Edenic nostalgias, eschatological optimisms and a lot of other flowery phrases I put in here, belongs to the long secular aftermath of the declaration that the kingdom has arrived in Christ and the prince of this world has been judged and cast out. It's a sort of oblivious memory of Paul's message that all the powers of the present age have been subdued and death and wrath defeated, not by the law, which for all its sanctity is impotent to set us free, 
but by a gift that has canceled the law's power over against us. You know, and the only law, and I mean, if I seem to be speaking in extremes, I think I'm, I'm, I'm being only faithful to Paul's language. The only law for which, uh, in which it is possible for the church truly to live is the commandment to love one another, this law, and it's a law of love that is somehow anarchic in its universal embrace. In Christ, there's no division between Jew and Greek, free and slave, man and woman, and Paul is, especially in Galatians, adamant. Those who've been emancipated from the law's power may not now turn back to the law for shelter on pain of subjecting themselves again to the elements of the age that is passing, and thus of excluding themselves from the age that is coming to birth. So, uh, time, uh, I think I have 10 minutes. Uh, perhaps Christian culture has always been haunted uh, by a somewhat irresoluble dilemma. The mystery of a seemingly impossible mediation between the kingdom's charitable law lawlessness, which is a higher law, supposedly, and the practical necessities of social life within fallen time. Um, for those uh, who cannot, for instance, retreat to monastic communities, which are the communities traditionally that have tried in some way to embody this notion of living by this lawless law of charity, however imperfectly, uh, those who cannot retreat from the world where positive law must operate, you know, society, the family, all the commanding heights and, and sheltered valleys of, of culture, the mediation of the law is of its nature always something imperfectly defined, something of a hermeneutical and creative struggle, always somewhat alien. I mean, Christians must believe that a, a, a Christian society is a possibility, uh, otherwise the church would be pointless. But its political and legal configurations are anything but obvious and are subject to constant re revision, not only in response to material developments, but because of this spiritual dynam uh, dynamism that's intrinsic to the gospel itself. And um, it's why, you know, within Christian tradition, there couldn't be, and, and, and would that there could perhaps, or although it has problems of its own, no doubt, a, a, a sort of tradition of law and legal tradition analogous to Sharia. It's not simply a matter of cultural difference, it's that, that such a body of law would not be intelligible within the terms of, of the gospel. I mean, it, something vague and analogous perhaps, but in a very profound sense, Christians inhabit history as pilgrims and maybe in some sense as fugitives. But uh, if if it were not for this essential ambiguity in the Christian approach to civil law, which is inexact and tentative and conjectural and endlessly corrigible uh, in the light of the preaching of the kingdom, Western history would be perhaps missing much of its, of its exhilarating and tragic uh, drama. And this uh, includes much of both the creativity and the destructiveness of modern Western society, which is a consequence not simply of the disintegration of a Christian cultural consensus, but of an ancient and perhaps ultimately uh, non-negotiable tension within Christian culture itself. Um, one sees this you know, in the history of, uh, of, of slavery and abolition. It would be comforting to believe that, that the way the early church viewed the institution of slavery, for instance, was simple, straightforward, and, and, and obvious. Um, I mean, there was, there was uh, it, before the age of Christianity in the, in the empire, it's, it's doubtful that slavery could have been recognized as an institution at all that is, as a, as a practice entirely contingent upon human custom because pre-Christian European culture simply had no concept of the history of sin. Um, but on the other hand, the first generations of Christians living not only on the margins of society, but at the end of days, clearly had no occasion to imagine a human society this side of the eschaton from which the institution was absent. Paul's letter to Philemon is a, is a moving 
plea that a master recognize his slave as his brother, not his chattel. But, uh, and, and it's more radical in its prescriptions than even, even the most luminous texts of the Stoics, but at the end of the day, there's no political, no legal uh, uh, cerebration going on there. There's no concept that history is something with which Christians have to deal, or society is something that Christians have to constitute uh, outside the, the very real uh, uh, community of the church. And uh, of course, in later Christian history, the, the approach to the institution was ambiguous. It was, uh, uh, there was always the uh, Christian sense of a certain apocalyptic irony in the practice that, that this is obviously a result of the fall. But when you read the church fathers, for instance, you can have someone fiercely denouncing slavery in what almost seemed like abolitionist terms, like Gregory of Nyssa or his sister Macrina uh, prevailed on their mother to free the slaves. But then there was their brother Basil who said, well, slavery is a useful institution until Christ comes again, because most people, really, there are many people who simply can't govern themselves morally. You know. But we also see in this history uh, that the, uh, the medieval decline in chattel slavery in the West was as much a, part, a, a result, we, we tend to think, at least you know, modern social history often tells us, it's the result of economic developments, economic changes in Western Europe. But there's, some, there's considerable historical evidence that's not the whole story. It was also because a society was now created in which everyone was baptized, and it was impossible not to rep recognize, uh, the, for all the injustices of medieval society, impossible not to recognize the corporate identity within Christ. Two minutes, and maybe three minutes over. <laughs> anyway, I'll skip on ahead. Um, uh, all the uh, all the you know practical interesting stuff that I was I was asked to put in about slavery and the women's movement I'm going to skip, but it's uh, it's it's fascinating, um, <laughs> and by far the most intelligent part of the paper. So you just have to take my word for it. All of this. Uh, so let me let me wind up. <clears throat> English. All this being said, the fact remains that the narratives of liberation that most powerfully shape society today, however, whatever their remote theological antecedents or religious causes might be, presume an understanding of freedom that is not only no longer explicitly Christian, but is in many ways incompatible with or unintelligible within a Christian view of the human being. And this by itself has to be taken as evidence of Christian culture's failure. Uh, at least over the course of modern history, but over the course of its history, perhaps to give durable form or adequate content to a vision of society that could actually translate the anarchy of Christian love into positive law or civil order. That was a complete failure, but a, a failure enough. We live now under the regime of negative liberty, which is admittedly a, a very comfortable situation to find ourselves in, but in which it also means that we have all become the sovereign possessors of an ever emptier liberty in many ways, citizens of a social order that on principle does not aspire to the pedagogy of the good. And this of course means that we enjoy to a very great de degree only the kind of liberty that best serves the interests of the state or of the market. It's very much, uh, after all, at the heart of the modern project that both state and market should enclose as much of our cultural commons as possible, while banishing to the realm of private fixations and eccentric associations any cultural forces that might prove intractable to their aims. The ideal citizen of the modern civil order, I know because I've read Thomas Jefferson through and through, and he doesn't escape from this claim, is both dependent upon the state for his or her legal and social identity, and at the same time is a wholly liberated consumer with the resources to choose whatever and as much he or she will. Any ideas or loyalties that might dilute this dependency or inhibit this liberty must not be allowed to enter the world of law, or really even of licit public discourse. They must remain safely sequestered in the world of, of, of personal psychology. And whatever the future of Christian social thought may be, it begins from this situation. Its primary task, it seems to me, if, if anyone's interested, is 
must be to enunciate a vision of freedom that neither idealizes away the injustices of the past nor surrenders to the soporific freedom of mere negative liberty. And as always, any worthwhile Christian theology of culture has to confront ever anew its own baffling, fruitful, dangerous inner tension between an apocalyptic consciousness somehow beyond the law and the sacramental reality of a fallen world that groans in anticipation of its transformation into the kingdom. The question of freedom for Christians always, it seems to me, remains how to live corporately and lawfully within the anarchic prodigality of divine love and the light of divine goodness without attempting to collapse that tension or flee from it to a liberty that makes not free. Thank you. Well, we've had two very uh, dense and provocative talks. Go, go on, go on. Go on, man. <laughs> uh, and now you know what question David wants to be asked. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to open the floor now for discussion, but I, I would ask uh, that those who are participants in the, uh, in the Building Bridges seminar, that uh, you will have a chance to, to speak to one another on these subjects uh, over the next couple of days, so we'll, we'll give a little space to the, uh, the people who are visiting for this afternoon, if they would, uh, and if they don't front up, then you're welcome. Yes, hello, yes. my name is Ernest Tucker from the American Naval Academy. Thank you both for excellent and interesting talks. I want to address my question to Dr. Abdullahi. The whole question, I wonder if you could touch very briefly, I mean, implicitly you touched on the question of conversion. I mean, within one could f subsume that under apostasy, but I wonder if you could reflect specifically on the particular challenges in our modern era of the issue of conversion in, in, in the context of your remarks. Yes, Thank okay. you. Uh, of course, I mean, there was so much that I couldn't say, but the point about, about conversion and uh, um, proselytization, question of mission, uh, has such a heavy baggage of uh, colonial and new colonial uh, projects that it's very dis difficult to disentangle sort of a pure question of freedom of religion. To me, freedom of religion means the, the, the freedom to believe or not to believe, and to believe in any religion or no religion. That, that is, to me, that's inherent to the idea of religion, of being po uh, religious. But the question of conversion and the question of proselytization, um, it has a history as a spearhead of colonialism in Africa, in, and, and, and that sort of colonial and neo-colonial sort of project uh, tends to confuse the issue. And for me, the question will go back to that notion of mediation. So we should understand where the apprehensions are coming from, but not to concede the denial of the claim of ones to be free to believe or not to believe, or to convert. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm very tempted to engage your interpretation of Paul, but I uh, would rather like to um, um, uh, address the rather gloomy notion of modernity that you both uh, uh, offered. And I think that is indeed one side of the development. But uh, um, uh, I think that uh, uh, the uh, strong uh, attempts of modernity um, uh, that I at least uh, uh, grew up in the academic environments in which I uh, lived and also in the political was this strong strife for a rationality continuum and a universal morality. And at the same time, um, Christoph Schwebel and I and many others have uh, shown this, modernity is driven by the differentiation of the rationality and morality continuum. So this is the inner tension that we host. But uh, given this tension, we have seen in modernity this enormous strive, an optimistic strive, for justice, truth, and freedom. Yeah. And uh, in, in qualified ways. So justice in terms of bringing the state under the government of the law, the pol politics under the government of the law, Have, achieving general mandatory education accompanied by the academy and by science, and steering a course of freedom through these powers. Okay, you can say it has partially failed. Truth was confused with individual certainty. 
uh, justice was um, um, yeah, contaminated by moral self-righteousness and illusionary uh, ideas of an abstract equality and uh, um, uh, freedom was contaminated in uh, the light uh, you uh, uh, just described, uh, um, yeah, nihilistic uh, free will, uh, uh, arbitrariness of individuals seemingly uh, unlimited self-unfolding and so on and so on. And then here are market media and postmodern, uh, soft postmodernism taking over. But is this the whole notion of modernity? I would rather uh, also look at the other side, which really um, provided us with enormous uh, societal developments that um, um, should not easily be dismissed. Yes. Um, well, yes. No, I, if I uh, gave the impression of, of giving only a gloomy picture of modernity, I'm sorry, but I, I generally give that impression whenever I talk uh, about, about anything. Uh, but I meant what I said when that's, I said that's not the whole story, that, that, that the, that the, the uh, demand for recognition, you know, in the Hegelian sense, the demand uh, for the ascent of the individual out of subsid just purely subsidiary identity so that, so that there is an equality of recognition before the law, before civil society, is a real, uh, um, you know, it partakes in uh, this history of the Christian enunciation of what had happened in Christ and the failure of Christian society f fully to realize those goods uh, is in part what leads to uh, a recuperation of those ideas in a, in a, a, under the banner of secularism. But I, I didn't, uh, I mean, I did mean what I said, that, 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 that there are two sides to the story and that you can't either idealize away the injustices of the, path, the past or simply grant that as a good American, I should believe that it, because I can choose among 700 different brands of inedible bread, I am free. Um, but I mean, I, I would agree with you that this, you, you can't you can't locate yourself simply, in, uh, you know, cursing the darkness of modernity without recognizing the genuine uh, spiritual and moral uh, legacy of Christianity reflected in in, in in the modern demand for recognition. Uh, for my part, I, I don't think that I presented any view, whether gloomy or not, of modernity. All I said is. A modernity in which I have no place, that is, in which I have no stake, I have no say in defining what it means and what to do with it, is not for me. That's all I said. So if the modernity that you describe is the modernity that does not permit me to fully engage and to, to contribute to defining what it means and, uh, and how it, what it means to me, which may not necessarily, actually by definition, is not going to be what it means to you or anybody else. So that is my point about self-determination. Uh, whether that is a, a modern concept or not, and how modern and what to do with it, uh, is not necessarily of, of important to me. You know, I, I, I'm not interested in claiming modernity or denouncing it. I'm interested in my right to speak and to be who I am by choice and conviction. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Samira Daniels again. Um, I've been. Uh, engaged with a lot of different groups over the past 14, 15 years. And I think the thing that uh, I'm, I'm wrestling with that in terms of the, um, the relationships with among Muslims and Christians and Jews is that you know a few narratives took hold and uh, they, they were engaged in, in, in among a few groups and as a consequence, there, there is just a, an absolute uncivil, nearly vulgar discussion that goes on. Uh, and Chris Hedges alludes to it in his book, Empire of um, Illusion, where, where conversations have become extremely toxic in, in a lot of ways. And, I th and I'm wondering if any of you could, uh, particularly uh, the Muslims in relationship in the dialogue with Muslims and Christians in, in, the, in, in different circles, how Muslims can sort of address this and, and Christians can address it because I think it's the, the atheists that are vocal have had a lot of um, you know, sway in, in steering, this, uh, steering this discussion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, oh, oh, sure. Um, well, I, I think in part uh, the uncivil character, uh, of which we're all guilty, uh, I, I'm especially guilty when I'm at my best, uh, but, but the uncivil character uh, in part is, is, is a reflection of the uh, collapse of any actual rational grammar in which to conduct the arguments. One of the aspects of the paper I didn't read from it, what, what, I, I recently uh, was uh, reading over the debates on women's suffrage, strange to say, and of all places, Harper's Magazine from the 1850s to the turn of the century. And the thing that's astonishing is that it's almost entirely a theological debate. And I mean a sophisticated theological debate. For those who read Harper's now, you would never believe this, but there were editors of the magazine writing long discussions on, on women's suffrage in relation to the doctrine of the Trinity and the, and the understanding of the church as the body of Christ, and women arguing in Pauline terms and, and what people were. And the, the, the discussions were heated. But, but, but what was interesting to me about reading that, though, was that there was a shared realm of intelligibility. They had a tradition within which they were working. Today, any moral claim is an assertion. And it's an assertion out of a void. I mean, that's Alice, Alice de McIntyre's chief provocation to the way we talk about ethics today, is that it's this bizarre bricolage of what we Quite often, our discussions of what we will to be the case, but to which we cannot give any uh, uh, philosophic, any intellectual content, because we don't, st we're not speaking within a tradition that 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 uh, has a recognizable hierarchy of values and ultimate good towards which we aspire. And I think part of the ferocity of the debate is this is part of the pathology of modernity. To get to the gloomy side, is that modernity. Uh, uh, you know, understands itself in terms of a set of abstractions that cannot be traced back to to, to agreed upon principles that make any sense. So, um, for my part, I would add, I think that what actually recalling what the Archbishop said this morning about reading the wrong newspapers, that I think that the, the sort of the lack of civility. The question is, it depends where you look uh, and who the interlocutors are. Uh, and I think we, get, we tend to be locked into our very tiny world that we sort of universalize and generalize in terms of this is what's going on everywhere with everybody. Uh, my, I'm from Sudan. I'm from Sudan. I, and I lived in Sudan until I was 40 years old. And I have traveled throughout Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia. And I, I think most of the time I find people who are at peace with themselves, at peace with others, and that I don't see that the, 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 the lack of civility and the confrontation that, that we see in certain segments at particular moments regarding particular issues. But by and large, I mean, if you think just in terms of numbers, uh, if you are talking about Muslims at this point being one, in, uh, according to the BBC recent, I mean, the Pew study, one quarter of the world population are Muslims. Um, more than that are Christians and, and so on. But, but the, where, where are all of these people? Who, are, are they really being uncivil to each other? Are they really being confrontational and, and violent? I don't think so. I don't think that life would be livable if the picture that we have about interreligious relations, intercommunal relations, are the way that we tend to think in our minds, in the darker moments of our minds, that it is. I am a very optimistic, confident that really uh, religion is thriving. And it never went away to come back. It was always here for me. It never left any, anywhere. That I find it tremendously resourceful, tremendously inspiring and powerful. And I'm very happy with it. Yeah, I agree with you, but I'm just saying it's controlled by a smaller... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Christoph Sprube, in. Um, I have two questions, one to um, David Bentley Hart and one to two panelists. The first is um, to David, is, is Christianity really as antinomian as you make it out? Is it really only an Mine interruption? Is. Um, <laughs> it doesn't have to stay that way. Um, I once was at a conference at at Yeshiva University, where Sharia scholars, Talmudists, and Roman canon lawyers had a wonderful discussion. And as I, as a Lutheran systematic th 
theologian, was suddenly the odd one out, and they were convinced law is the essence of religion. No. Um, now, it seems to me that um, this negative view of the law is bound to a particular notion of the law which the sophist first introduced into the history of the West, that law is um, a conventional strategy to restrain freedom. Now, law could be exactly the kind of regularities that make it possible for something to achieve its end. And then, of course, the whole discourse has a completely different meaning. I think theologically we're not bound to have this notion, rather impoverished notion of law that characterizes modernity. So that would be my first question. The second concern is, con uh, is, is connected with that. Um, are we really, um, um, do we really have to be as anti-institutional as we have been throughout the day? I'm, I'm astonished by that. Um, that, for example, there is only personal authority, was one statement um, you made here. I, I see exactly what you mean. But on the whole, that seems to me just to be a continuation of the modern critique of institutions where freedom is basically the liberation from institutions. Would it not also be possible to have a visions, vision of institution where in institutions guarantee the structure of relatedness that makes freedom possible, so that institution is indeed a precondition for exercising freedom. And that is something that one has to say. All these modern, um, postmodern, charismatic forms of Christian and other religions, they change once the necessity for institutionalizing certain structures comes about. And having an institution can be um, an element of gaining freedom. If the authority is no longer only personal, it's much less oppressive. Yeah. It can also be institutional in having, so to say, um, structures which can be filled by a, a number of different persons. And I think it's very important um, to see uh, this kind of movement towards institutionalization, at least in Christianity, also as a positive one, because it was not only an interruption, but also the way in which, in the interruption of the message of the kingdom, the continuity and faithfulness of the um, will of the creator is evidenced. And that is bound to a certain understanding of the regularities and the order of creation. Wouldn't you think that is at least a possibility that would liberate us from the rampant anti-institutionalism that we've had so far? I, I wasn't aware that we'd had rampant anti-institutionalism, but, uh, you know, I suppose it all depends on what your recent experiences of institutions are, and I've had a few recently. Um, uh, but uh, I, I did mean to give both sides of the picture. I was talking about a certain problem uh, that seems to have recurred in, uh, in the history of Christian culture. Of course, you need institutions. Uh, at the beginning, when I was talking about a pedagogy of the good, the notion that, that, that you could have purely non-institutional Christianity means you have Christianity that just doesn't exist. It would, be, uh, it, would be, it would be a set of sentiments, perhaps. And I didn't mean to deny that. I was simply trying to counterbalance that, what, what I, seems to be an obvious reality, that the, that the church had to become an institution with all of the problems and all of the blessings that entails. The fact that is is that there is this uh, at the same time um, disruptive quality also that remains present in the gospel throughout, which can be the source of a very fruitful or very dangerous, you know, set uh, movements uh, and, and that the have bedeviled Christian history. Um, but I, but I certainly uh, didn't mean to sound uh, too antinomian. I do think, however, if you're going to be honest, especially to Paul in Galatians, less so in Romans perhaps, um, you have to at first realize just how shocking his language was to Jews and Gentiles alike. I mean, there is a real provocation there that is, is demanding that you abandon your expectations of what the law can do, what cult can do, what the cosmos can do. <laughs> um, and uh, and if in in as I say compressing all of all of this material into 30 minutes, I gave the impression that I was a, I was a free church uh, uh, rebel, which I, I'm, I may be in the make. I don't know, but I'm, ta I'm Eastern Orthodox, so I'm sort of comfortable with institutions as long as they're not too well organized. <laughs> so, 
lots of incense. So. Uh, again, for my part to add, I think I, I don't, I don't, I didn't realize that was being anti-institutional. I think I'm just trying to understand that I see institutions as the outcome of personal agency. I mean, to me, individual responsibility. Uh, since I am individually accountable. I have to be the, the, the locus and the grounding of religious authority to me. And I think I was talking about religious authority in particular, not, not social or economic or political in a, in a wider sense. Uh, all of that, a good society organized institutionally, and as you describe it, I mean, that's a very attractive notion of, of institutions that I would embrace. Uh, and I don't mind engaging that notion, but for me the point is that it is I who engage and it is I who disengage, because it is I who is accountable. Nobody else is. Vincent. Uh, since no one else is getting up, I'll try to be devil's advocate here. Uh, first of all, I want to ask an important question, primarily to Abdu, but also to David, because I think it, it, it's, it's relevant for both. Uh, and. To preface it, I'm not adding a leading, asking a leading question. This is something I'm not sure how to answer myself, and I was wondering how you two might think about it. Um, Jeremy Bentham famously said, he said, if I get the quotation right, for me, a right is a child of the law. A right that is not, in company, that is not accompanied by a law is a child without a father. Now, what he's talking about is, of course, the issue in, in legal philosophy about the fact that you can't really talk about a right without talking about an obligation in the sense that a right for me is an obligation for someone else. And this sticks in my mind a lot because especially as, 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 as we all know, there's been a lot of discussion about rights, Sharia, Islamic law, principles that are being advanced as fundamental principles. And yet, if Bentham is right, can we meaningfully talk about rights in an Islamic context without accompanying the discussion of rights with the discussion of creating new schools of law? Mm. In other words, again, going back to Christoph's issue also, which is, you know, do, you know, can we talk about this without building a structure in which to contain it? Uh, or if we don't, are we just, in a sense, indulging in a romantic assertion of the will? Since, uh, let me start on this one. Uh, I think Benson is talking about legal rights in particular. But, yeah, rights in general. This is but if, he, if he meant rights in general, then he's wrong. Uh, to, to be blunt about it. So the point to me is legal rights are part, are necessary but insufficient. A notion of rights ultimately is necessary but insufficient. Uh, in the sense that uh, I think I tried to hint at this, and it is in the text of the paper, that the notion of, of, of entitlement and rights and obligations and so on is ultimately about human judgment and discretion. That, that yes, you are right that um, every right assumes a, a, an obligation, but it is not an obligation of someone to give legal remedy for a right, but it is an obligation on the right claimant to exercise good judgment because a right abused is a right lost. So that I cannot claim a right if I'm not willing to exercise discretion and good sense and judgment and that we get socialized into how we practice our rights. And so for me, ultimately, I mean, talking about religion or religiously as a Muslim, the ultimate framework is in terms of my divine accountability to God, my relationship to God, and in that frame, there is always um, a right and an obligation, uh, not even a right in the sense of an entitlement. But in the social realm, yes, I need legal rights in the sense that Bentham meant. I need other wider formations, philosophical and other formations. But ultimately, it is not about, for me, if freedom is freedom from fear, that's the point of having rights. That's the point of being alive. Uh, ultimately, uh, and in that, at that level, I don't see how the rights and obligation in that uh, Benthonian sense uh, is, is relevant, I think. Um, yeah, I, I don't have much to add. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would agree that uh, every right is also an obligation. I think much of the, the modern understanding, though, of, of freedom would say, my right is your obligation. 
but has more trouble saying my right is my obligation. Um, and uh, that the one accompanies the other necessarily is something we're very, very bad at making sense of now. But of course, uh, if you're going to talk, in that, you, you, need, uh, you need a regime of law. You need institutions of law. Uh, but where does the law come from? It's one thing, and, and perhaps it's a romantic uh, fable, it's a nostalgia for a world that never was, but it's one thing to think of laws emanating from a sort of cultural commons, a, a sort of a, a realm of shared uh, aspirations towards a vision of the good that is aware of local realities, communal realities. And uh, law understood as I think it inevitably, if not understood as, at least inevitably functions as in a large so a country like the United States based on a set of abstract principles that are only partially realizable. Law becomes a set of constraints and permissions that do not necessarily have that grounding. Um, and you know, that's the problem of modernity for all traditions. Um, uh, and, uh, but but no, no, you can't have rights without law. That, that, that I, I agree with that entirely. Uh, I'm sorry because I did miss the, the second part of your question. If we, uh, I agree completely that we need the structures, we need the institutions. I, I'm not saying that we don't. For me, the question is how to locate institutions in their proper context and not to give them exaggerated sense of uh, importance. But if we need to establish new schools, by all means. If we need to establish new ways of thinking about Sharia, that is by all means. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not denying that. I'm just simply trying to bring it to a level of how my personal responsibility for my rights and accountability for my rights is critical for possibilities of transformation. Please join me in thanking our, our two speakers.